Yesterday I went into central London to um, attend the uh, march against fascism and racism and so on. Um, there was a coalition of different groups that were involved in the march, so it wasn't any one group per se. So you had some which were, you know, say no to UKIP and others which were uh, say no to Islamophobia, the Stop the War Coalition was there, and so on. Um, and uh, each of those causes I was quite happy to uh, associate myself with. So I went on down, uh, put a placard in each hand, and, and marched down from, uh, from the BBC down to Trafalgar Square. I really, really regret now not having taken my digital camera. I thought to take it, but I didn't have an SD card. Uh, so there was nothing to record on to, as it were, but um, which is really unfortunate because I should have taken a camera to record the speeches. I knew that Diane Abbott was going to be speaking there, and the leader of the Green Party was going to be speaking there, and I knew that George Galloway was going to be speaking there, and and uh, a few other names that I sort of semi recognized But um, the best speeches by far were by the people whose names I wouldn't have recognized, anyways. Um, there were several people there who were family members, mothers mostly, a sister as well, um, of young black men who've been killed by the police and they've had no sense of justice. Uh, none of the police who've done the killing have had to face a trial. Uh, some of these people have been pursuing justice for more than 20 years and uh, still uh, remain unsatisfied. Their speeches were incredibly moving and I'm regretful in the extreme that I didn't record them. But suffice to say, I've got friends across the pond in the USA who seem to think that uh, this problem is uh, just happening in America. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think this problem happens all over the world uh, in various different ways. And, um, uh, you know, this is one reason why power always needs to be kept in check. Because the powerful tend to protect one another. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a sort of like a, on a nod and a wink almost sort of a thing. There's nothing official about it. It's not institutional. It's just the way things work, and uh, that's pretty clear to me now. I wanted to talk about policing in general. Uh, you know, things from how it appears from here in the UK, things in America seem to be getting well spiraling. In fact, a little bit uh, out of control as regards heavy-handed policing. And uh, I've done my fair share of traveling around the world. My daughter has done even more than me. In the past six years, she's traveled to, I think, 26 countries. And uh, she spent most of December in South America. And when she came back, we had a conversation. And among the topics we talked about was uh, the different ways of policing in different parts of the world because now that she's been to Asia, South America, Europe, and North America, she's had uh, a lot of exposure to the different ways, different cultures approach policing. And I myself have been uh, various different places in Europe. I can tell you now from my American perspective, uh, the police in Rome, very scary, very scary. Just, just their presence is scary. Um, where on the other hand, when I've been to Amsterdam, uh, you barely notice the police are there. There's more police in Penzance than there are in Amsterdam. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, I spent uh, two weekends in Amsterdam at various different times. And uh, in both instances, I only saw one police car. And the police cars are barely noticeable there. Uh, they've got like a single stripe of reflective tape going down the side. And the word police is written about six inches on the side of the car. I think they do have tumbler lights, but I think that the tumbler lights are actually inside the vehicle, not, not resting on top. So it's pretty discreet. And considering the fact that you can buy, you know, psychedelic mushrooms legally and, or, you know, smoke marijuana to your heart's content in Amsterdam, and considering there's a, a red light district right in the center of town and, uh, you know, it has all the, uh, the normal activities you expect in a capital city as well. And considering all that, the, the fact that the police presence is extremely muted, um, you might assume there'd be more trouble. But in fact, the opposite is true. I've never been any place I felt safer than Amsterdam. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Amsterdam is necessarily a safe city. I've got three friends who were mugged there. But I always felt perfectly safe walking around Amsterdam. And that was regardless of the fact that uh, the police were virtually invisible. 
my daughter when she was in South America and she's also been to Costa Rica this past couple of months and uh, she said she didn't even see the police in Costa Rica and it was the most calm and peaceful uh, culture and country she's ever been to she contrasted that with uh, Rio in Brazil she spent uh, about two weeks in Brazil in general but uh, the last four or five days in Rio and she said the police were positively frightening in, in Rio uh, she said they're openly heavy-handed and also not just the police but uh, regular citizens are just sort of you know walking around packing uh, you know including automatic weapons and so forth so it didn't feel to her from her British point of view like a very safe place I think it's interesting how different countries and different cultures do approach policing differently and I don't think you can separate the two I, I, I don't think you can take this policing model say from the Netherlands and apply it someplace else and expect to get the same results because there's cultural differences which have a play and a say here as well this is one of the problems I wanted to talk about as well as uh, I think it's pretty clear to anybody who's honest about it with ourselves uh, as Americans that our culture is uh, at war with itself and um, we need some cultural healing like pronto you know and but how do you change a culture culture will change regardless of any effort you put in so it stands to reason that if you want to direct that change effort is required and you know I like to think that having conversations uh, you know with people from all over the country and all over the world about these sorts of issues you know is a drop in the ocean um, toward making that change but I'm just curious how we can make a bigger push I mean I'm all for going to demonstrations and, and carrying on doing that as much as is within my power to do if it's a cause I believe in and I'm able I'll go I'm even prepared to get arrested for certain causes but um, me getting arrested all by itself isn't going to change things. Every drop counts, but it just makes me wonder how much there has to be before we reach a tipping point and change for the better sort of takes root en masse rather than constant conflict and uh, you know name calling and, and us versus them mentality which seems to be our biggest Achilles heel as far as I'm concerned. I know this has been a bit of a ramble, but uh, I just couldn't stay indoors. I wanted to come out and, and uh, chat with what was on my mind at the moment. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you've got any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them down below. And I'll see you again next time. Until, until then, may all your ups and downs be ups.